Should children under 18 be able to buy guns? Hi everyone, welcome to Answers News for June the 8th, 2022. Hi, I'm Brian Osborne. This is Dr. Gabriella Haynes. That is Rob Webb, resident rocket scientist. Just rocket science. And this is uh, Answers News. And we got a live studio audience. You guys clap and make yourselves known. To, Yay! To live. There we go. Nice. That's no awesome. golf claps there. <laughs> a lot of claps. Good stuff. Lots of people here today. Got a packed house here at yeah. the Creation Museum. Always great to see that. And we'll dive into our first article. Why do we let children buy firearms? So this one's a very interesting article. This is actually written by someone who's trying to deal with the current mass shootings. And they're trying to figure out how should they respond. And they're coming at it from a secular worldview. And so they're trying to really make sense of what's going on, how to give answers to the problems of our culture, how to deal with these mass shootings, how to categorize them in their secular thinking. And they make this argument in this particular article by the Washington Post that we are letting children buy firearms. Now, by children, they mean 18-year-olds, okay? And so our purpose in talking about this article is not to talk about gun control per se, what you should and should not do, if there should be changes or not be changes. That's a different show for a different time. Our focus here is on the inconsistency of the secular pagan ideology of our day. You see, they're suggesting here in this article that 18-year-olds are not responsible enough to buy firearms, even though they can vote and they can join the military, they can actually give themselves medical consent, they can skydive, they can be roped into jury duty, they can get married without parental consent, they can file a lawsuit, all sorts of great things, uh, but they're not, of course, and they can vote as well, but they should not be allowed to buy firearms. Yet those same people with this ideology would suggest that eight-year-olds should be allowed to decide they have a different physical gender and to demand puberty blockers and to demand surgeries to remove perfectly healthy body parts. And so our focus is really the inconsistency of that secular ideology in this article. Yeah, yeah, and, and at the same time, we want to make sure that we're sensitive to anyone that might be grieving through these school right. shoot shooting right now. We need to make sure that we're continuing to pray for these families that are hurting that may, may have lost, um, you know, children or family members from these school shootings, of course. And uh, but we are a biblical authority ministry, of course. We want to make sure that we're providing answers that are helpful from a biblical worldview. And like Brian was saying, you th you see a lot of the inconsistency as well throughout this. They're tr they're trying to say 18 year olds, you know, they. They can't be able to buy guns, but even eight-year-olds can essentially mutilate themselves through the transgender um, transitions and all that stuff. So you basically see that all the way through and through. Yeah, and that's that's expected from a um, evolutionist and secular worldview to see those inconsistencies. Because once that you are not based on God's word, you're just going with man's word, and this man's word is just a mess because it's not based on any absolute truth and that's that's one of the things that we want to show here just the inconsistency and and that's something that we all have to be looking um in papers and magazines when we hear something like any uh story uh being told we have to check what is the inconsistencies that i can see here right there because it's important for, so we can know what is the agenda what is the the propaganda what they're trying to mm -hmm. conceive right there and really, if you think about the atheistic worldview, the evolutionary worldview, they don't have a basis for consistency. They don't have a basis right. for logic or for knowledge. And so inconsistencies in their worldview is not really an issue. So that's why they don't see it. Whereas the biblical worldview, we actually have those answers. We can actually right. stand on God's word, on God's word alone. So we can actually have answers, you know, in terms of what's going on, how to be able to grieve with those that are grieving, of course. And just as well, you know, it's, it's really the core issue here is sin, of course, because it's not the firearms that are killing people. It's it's really the sin that is at the issue. And just reminds me as well that, um, you know, in any 18-year-olds any that are young men that are, you know, preparing to become a father, that actually have families, they are commanded to be a leader, a provider, and a protector in their, in their home. So actually in the biblical worldview, they're actually encouraged to actually go through and make sure that they're protecting their family as well. So, but you see the opposite with the uh, atheistic worldview happening there. And it's interesting, the first few articles we'll cover today are really just, they're secular people trying to grapple with what's happening in their culture with these sort of mass shootings, these mass killings. And they're really, you can tell they're feeling the pain from these events as they should feel that pain, as we all should feel that pain. But it's only the biblical worldview that can self-consistently explain why we care for the lives that are lost during those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Within the biblical worldview, those kids, those people who were killed were made in the image of God. That's and right. that was attacked and assaulted. And we care because they're made in God's image. But within the secular worldview, if there is no God, then why would murder be wrong? If evolution is true and we're just rearranged pond scum, why care if somebody dies, even if they're a kid? They're just a random accident with no eternal value. So they're still even borrowing from the biblical worldview to care about it at all. 
then you try mm -hmm. to misapply that worldview mm -hmm. to fit their own purposes. But you, what you're really seeing here is this struggle to try to explain this from their perspective. Yep. Yep. Which leads right into the next article from the LA Times. A columnist there says, invoking God amid Texas shooting uh, is really analogous to the faith that allowed brutal enslavement here in America. And so this is a columnist from, and it's an opinion columnist from the LA Times, L.Z. Granderson, who were ripping people who were calling the country to turn to God during this horrific time, during the uh, Uvalde, Texas shootings, claiming that they're wanting people to turn back to a faith that allowed for brutal enslavement in America for centuries. And throughout the entire article, the communists are trying to make the argument that, never is never, that America has never really been a good nation. It's always been broken. It's always been really horrific because of slavery in the past. And no doubt, there have been bad things in the past. But right off the bat, they need to understand that really it wasn't the biblical faith that actually made brutal enslavement possible in America. Actually, the Bible condemns brutal enslavement all the way through, Old and New Testament. Men stealers, kidnappers, people who traded other people, they were to be killed. Capital punishment was given to those particular people. Now, bond servitude and working as an employee of sorts and a way to repay debt in the Old Testament, of course, there were laws around that, but that was serving employment. It wasn't the sort of brutal enslavement that's been happening in America in the mm -hmm. past. And so automatically, they're wrong from the get-go there. But again, they're trying to explain all these things from their secular perspective, and they're really saying that America has been broken from the beginning. And so really they're saying that the answer is gun control to a certain degree, but not God, because in their worldview, God doesn't exist. Yeah, all throughout the article, you basically see the author. They're essentially angry with God, right? They're in rebellion against God. And it just affirms what the Bible says, that everyone knows God in the heart of hearts, but they rebel against him, of course. And, and they talk a lot about in terms of faith, but really it's not a question of do you have faith? It's where have you placed your faith in? Have you placed it in man's word or have you placed it in God's holy, infallible word? And so you see that battle between two different religions, two different worldviews. That's not neutral, by the way. It's a confident faith versus really a blind faith. That's what it comes down to. So the atheistic worldview, you know, they say a lot of things like the brutal enslavement and that how it's evil. But really, in there's, like we were talking about in the last article, in that worldview, how can you call anything evil without actually presupposing an actual standard? standard for morality. So to be able to call something good or evil, you have to be able to know, you have to be able to measure something against good, good or evil. So you see they're borrowing from that biblical worldview, of course. And like Brian was saying, Exodus chapter 21 says, man stealing is a sin. Man stealing is worthy of capital punishment. And it's actually, it was the Christians that actually abolished slavery in the Western um, culture today, it wasn't the atheist. It wasn't the atheistic worldview, the naturalistic worldview that abolished slavery. It was faithful Christians going and calling out to the legislators, calling out to those that were in charge and saying, look, these people are made in the image of God. These people are valuable. These people are deserving. And that was based on God's word and God's word alone that they were actually, actually have, be able to have that basis. Um, so you just kind of basically see that inconsistency throughout that worldview. In the secular worldview, why murder is wrong. There is no, they don't have any reason for that. They borrow that from us, from the Christian worldview, and then they try to apply. And one thing that I was, when I was reading, I thought it was, um, it kind of brought it to my mind, is they, they kind of mad because people are, are saying like, hey, turn to God. Mm -hmm. The only one that can save this nation is God because we need to have our heart changed. And the yeah. only one that can do that is God. And, uh, God's son was also killed in that cross for my sin, for your sin. And that's what the people were saying, hey, turn to the one that also saw his son being killed. So right. that's, uh, that's, uh, that's the hope that it's in Christ of salvation, of eternal salvation. And right. only a changed heart can do something good. Yeah, and that's essentially what they quote at the very end here. Texas Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, he basically nails it. He says, you just cannot change character without changing a heart. And really, that is the heart of the problem, is the problem of the heart. Right. Ezekiel 36 says, we have a heart of stone that needs to be transformed into a heart of the flesh so we can desire the things God desires, to follow his law, to follow his statutes, and hate the sin for what it is. And so, like, like Gabby was saying, that's only found through Jesus Christ. That's only found from becoming a new creation in Christ. Not a better creation, but a completely new creation in Christ that's only possible because of the finished work of the cross. And like Rob was saying, what you're seeing in these articles is that these people are mad at God, which is a great confirmation that God does indeed exist. You don't get that mad at someone who does not exist. You don't get mad at the tooth fairy. 
don't mean to ruin that for somebody, okay? But anyway, all right? See for yourself. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> and so it's a great confirmation that biblical worldview we know to be true, that God indeed does exist. And also, it's an interesting fact that for many of the mass shooters, not all, but for many of them, they actually embraced an evolutionary worldview. Mm-hmm. That was part of That's their correct. push for what they did. They believed in some sort of human natural selection, that some humans were better than others. And so if some humans are better than others, why not kill the lesser than humans? Much like Darwin thought or Hitler thought or many others mm-hmm. as well in the past. And then also, if evolution were true, and again, we're just rearranged pond scum, even if they were wrong, who cares? You're just killing something that's a chemical accident that has no more value than a fern or a cockroach. And so for many of those people who did these atrocities, and they are atrocities at the worst level, they were embracing that secular evolutionary ideology and just really applying it consistently, unfortunately. Right. And even in the, the last article that we were talking about, about uh, letting children buy firearms, um, the, the guy who murdered, um, and it was involved in the mass shooting, that he killed all those people. He was wearing a shirt, you know, natural selection. Mm-hmm. So yep. he was embracing the evolutionary worldview and idea. And, and that's what we have to be very careful. That's why we do what we do in this ministry. You know, we, tr- we give answers. We're we working to give answers because... It's not just, oh, just, it's just evolution, you know, it's just a concept. Why do you, do you care so much? It's because when you apply that concept in your life, when you're consistent right. with that concept, those are the things that are expected to happen. Worldviews have consequences. Yes, the worldview, what we think, shape the way that we act. That's right. It's, in, it's, 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 we have to be aware of that. And we as parents, what our kids think is going to shape their action. And in this case, it's deadly consequences because that, of the world Deadly view. consequences. So that's why it's very important. And then we, we, we talk about having a Christian biblical worldview um, and showing that the that's creation, right. it's very right. reasonable in that worldview too. That's right. I've heard it said like this, that ideas have consequences and bad ideas have victims. Mm-hmm. I'm see that yes. again and again. Yeah, yeah. 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 that is. Speaking of that, going on to the next article, again, kind of carrying on this trend of the previous two articles. Mm -hmm. Title here, A Culture That Kills Its Children Has No Future. Now, if you first read that article from kind of a conservative biblical mindset, you might be thinking, oh, great, this is a pro-life argument against Mm -hmm. abortion. That's not the point of this article at all. It's written by what appears to be someone who's very leftist, secular, pagan Mm -hmm. in their ideology. It doesn't seem to be a Christian worldview at all. And it's talking about how we see all these mass shootings and mass killings in our culture. And they're trying to, again, trying to figure out why. What's driving this? Why are people doing these sorts of things? Why are these people killing so many other people? What's driving all these horrific acts? And they conclude basically this, that America is vacillating between violent struggle and idle nihilism, life has no meaning, and is shuddering toward its end. Mm -hmm. And so the author points to, this is from The Atlantic, by the way, the author points to all many of the mass shootings recently. It says, the nature of the problem, as best I can tell, is that American life isn't about what is good, but is rather about nothing at all or violence itself. And again, ideas have consequences. And so as we see our culture, this is what the author I think gets right. As we see our culture abandon biblical truth, abandon biblical authority, abandon that meta narrative of scripture that should cover all of our lives and guide what we do and how we think and what we speak and what we say. As we abandon that, what are we left with? Well, just our opinions about what we think is right or wrong. But that's utterly arbitrary because your opinion could say one thing, your opinion could say something else, your opinion could say something else. Who's right? It's all meaningless. And in the secular worldview, when we die, we cease to exist. There's no memory preserved. You're just gone. Nothing matters. And so we're seeing people act out uh, in accordance with those ideas. Yeah. Yeah, and then just all the way throughout the article, they always mention the culture of death, the culture of death, and that's something we say a lot as well. It's, 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 a, it's a society, it's a culture that has abandoned God, ultimately will love death, like it says in Proverbs chapter 8. And really, we're, we're, we're living in, in the judges type of nation, like, like in Israel, when, when it says in Judges 21, no king in Israel, everyone did what was right in his, his own eyes, so basically elevating their own word, their own opinion above God's authoritative word, of course. And so you're seeing that again and again. And of course, you see the irony, of course, with, with the kids here being more valued than the preborn. Because really, anytime you see child in this article, you could easily substitute it with the preborn, which really is the more urgent matter. 
Uh, if, if you think about it, there's 3,000 innocent children that are being slaughtered every single day in our nation alone across this nation at abortion mills um, across this nation. And w one of the uh, quotes he also says here, which I think he also um, kind of gets onto the right track of, he says, these are the morbid sy sy uh, symptoms of a society coming undone, and they arise largely from policy choices made by interested parties with material motives, but really, it's our society is coming undone because it's a result of the church failing to be the salt and light that we need. This is something I said last week as well, just to clarify again, salt is a preservative from decay. Salt isn't just supposed to be um, enhancing the flavor of something, of course. It's going to be actually preserving something from decay, and that's what the church is called to do. We are called to, to preserve this culture from decay, and so being, being allowed to turn away from God's law, from God's word, we're seeing the judgment happening, like it says in Psalm chapter 2, O kings, O rulers, kiss the sun, lest you perish. And so that's what we're seeing. We're seeing judgment on this nation today. We need to repent. We need to continue to pray for this nation that we turn back to God's law and turn back to his standards. And actually, based on what you said, Rob, I had this quote in mind. I put it in the presentation, Proverbs 14, 12. There's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. Amen. And as our culture abandons God and follows its own thinking, its own <laughs> end, well, it's leading to death. Yeah, that shows that when we compromise, and when I say we, it's we personal level, right? Because sometimes we, we think, oh, the compromise of, of this uh, institution or organization of the church and all that, but when we, as personal, we compromise on anything, that the consequence it comes to the whole world. And we have to understand that because we, as parents, if we compromise, we're going to be teaching our kids the wrong way. And then they're going to be teaching their kids the wrong way. And, and, and that's, that's going to go on and on and on. So the reason why things are the way they are, it's because we, as church, we have compromised. And we, in a personal level, has also compromised in so many values, so many things. You know, and it's sad. It's very sad. But... Um, this article is just showing that yeah. when you abandon God, you have nothing left. Just yeah. death. Well, it's yeah. interesting in this article and the other ones too, this one in particular, they're, they're trying to find someone to blame. And so this author, she blames people with a different political view than her. She is very leftist in her ideology. So anyone with a conservative worldview, those who push for those conservative ideas or values in their culture, she thinks they're the ultimate problem and blames them for what's happening. And, but that's part of any worldview. There is a, we all realize there's a problem. The question is, what is the problem? That's what is the solution. Well, the biblical worldview gets the problem right. The problem is sin. Mm -hmm. And the problem is not just you. I mean, you are the problem, but it's also me. And it's Gabby and Rob. It's all of us because we're all sinners. And so the biblical worldview gets the problem right. It's all of us because of our sin. And the only answer to that sin is restoration to God through Christ alone. His perfect, infinite death on the cross, paying that payment we couldn't pay, his resurrection from the dead, defeating death, put your faith in him. That's the only answer. And so again, she's trying to find an answer, trying to identify the problem, but since this person's rooted in the wrong worldview, they're getting the wrong conclusion. Yeah, they talk about nihilism being meaningless and hopeless, but it's Jesus Christ, like Brian was saying, that is our hope. That is what we look forward to. And now we can move away from all of this, get to some science issues for today. I'm kind of glad to move yeah. away from this stuff, mm -hmm. all right? Yeah. Uh, so wild animals are evolving faster than anybody thought. And I cannot tell you how many times we see headlines just like this one. Time if you watch the show, you see it again and again. Wow, things are yeah. evolving faster than we thought. It's or things are evolving not as fast as we thought. Yeah. Or yeah. things right? are evolving yeah. totally different. Yeah. Or yeah. The, yeah. Evolution is always was, the answer, right? Yeah, it was funny because changing. I think yeah. it was a couple of weeks ago we were talking about this. And one article was like, oh, this, this group, it's evolving really fast. The other group, it's not evolving at all. And that's yeah, like, oh, that. fast that yeah. or, or slow? Okay, yeah, so. if it's fast, it's evolution. If it's slow, it's evolution. <laughs> you know, we joke, we joke in a church setting, like the right answer is always Jesus, right, uh -huh. in a church setting. In a secular setting, the answer is always evolution. Evolution. Or at least in a secular science yes. setting, right it's always there. evolution. But, yes, yeah. that's correct. And so basically in this article, they, are, they lay down the kind of the foundation that in the past, they thought evolution was slow. Charles Darwin thought evolution took place over long geological eras of time, uh, and then looking at variations. So that accumulated over time. They give the peppered moth as an example here. Elephants losing their tusks. They're still elephants. Fish uh, become resistant to different toxic chemicals. Um, and they're saying these things are actually occurring faster than we thought. And they looked at the study, a bunch of different animals over a long period of time. Animals since the 50s, they traced over 250,000 animals. This was 2.6 million hours of field work. 
to watch so, animals just a few hours, evolve. Just a few hours. All right? I and got what, tired. And what yeah. did they find in 2.6 million hours of field work? They found that birds evolved, get this, into birds. <laughs> Newsflash. All wow. Right? Yeah. And dogs I could, I could to never dogs. Expect that. I know. Now, yeah. they said the, the evolution was happening two to four times faster than they expected. And so they're thinking, wow, this is amazing. And so maybe things can evolve fast enough to keep up with climate change, but maybe they can't. And so the whole article is all about that. Yeah, so we put on the cr critical thinking hat here. This is called a logical fallacy of equivocation fallacy. So you're seeing that word of evolution. They're equivocating with natural selection, mutations, migrations, et cetera, et cetera, basically saying that this somehow is Darwinian evolution, but if we look at it, it's not an increase in information, right? It's just right. a reshuffling. It's basically mm -hmm. a rearranging of the information that was already there to begin with that God granted them with. And it's actually a loss of information, like they talk about here. Elephants lose their tusks, mm -hmm. right? So that's, that's, that's a loss of information. That's going the opposite way that evolution actually needs. So you're seeing that over and over again. Plus, you see reification fallacies as well, basically attributing you know, human characteristics to evolution, basically saying evolution did this, or evolution found a way, life found a way. I'm sure you guys have heard that before, right? So you see those fallacies over and over yeah, again. Evolution is not a person, okay? It's not an, an yeah. entity. It's a concept. Mm -hmm. So if you see evolution finding a way, run, because yeah. that's a, something <laughs> wrong right there. Go seek counseling, maybe. Go <laughs> seek counseling or something like that, because evolution doesn't do anything. Evolution is just a concept. And we hear that so many times. We see in, in books and all those kind of things saying, oh, evolution finds a way. That's a logical fallacy, totally a logical fallacy. One thing that I thought it was interesting here at the end, it says, however, shows that evolution cannot be discounted if we, can't to, if we want to accurately predict the near future of animals' population. So, so to predict the future of the animal population, you should use evolution. That's what they're saying here. But the prediction of evolution, that's evol this is how evolution, the process of evolution works. Mm -hmm. Death is the in the process. So it's something that expected and it's necessary actually in evolution. And evolution assumed. yeah, an evolution process uh, death is the question ne yes, the whole time. Necessary. Yeah. So why bother? Why bother? Why they're caring about death and all those problems? You know, that just show the inconsistency right here too. And just be aware, as they've been saying, you need to understand this is the fallacy that pops up all the time as mm. your kids read textbooks from their classrooms, as you go to zoos or museums or watch uh, science programs from National Geographic, you'll see them use this equivocation all the time. They'll say, we see animals, they'll say, we see evolution happening all the time. Therefore, evolution must be true. And then when you ask, well, what's the evidence for evolution? They say, oh, look at these birds. They evolved into... Birds. That wow. proves the whole theory that you came from a rock 3.5 billion years ago, and that fish evolved into philosophers yeah. given enough time. Mm -hmm. Or these dogs evolved into dogs, or moths evolved into vols, moths. And that variation proves the molecules to man evolution, they will say. But those two things are very different. Mm -hmm. Variation is a shuffling of the existing genetic information. Molecules to man evolution would require an increase of genetic information that's that right. is never observed with no. actual science and it's genetically biologically impossible mm -hmm. but that's the equivocation that happens all the time so be sure you're aware of that and that your kids are aware of that because you see it everywhere one time my professor in college he said that i was a fish i don't even know how to swim <laughs> <laughs> I know how to swim, and I'm not a fish. <laughs> <laughs> that was fishy. That was fishy. Oh, man. We have a fish okay. article. There's so, many, later, right? yeah, so many puns that could go right there. And this article kind of aligned with the same thinking. Pepper moss is deja vu all over again. So this one's kind of an interesting article written by someone who's actually in favor of intelligent design. Uh, and so uh, somewhat friendly to what we would say, at least to one degree. But it's about pepper and moss, how they're in, the, in their larvae state. They look kind of like sticks, and they can change their color to blend in with the trees they're on so they can be camouflaged well. It's an interesting variation. And so the author of this article is commenting on the author of a last article who made that observation about the larvae and then talked about the peppered moths. So the peppered moths are a classic icon of evolution used in textbooks for years. The idea was you saw these moths in a particular area around the world in the 1800s. They were peppered color, kind of a light gray. Then you have pollution take place in that particular area because of the Industrial Revolution. The trees get covered with a dark soot. And then the pepper moths evolve to be darker because the darker colors blended in better with the trees. Therefore, they weren't eaten by the predators. And they said, see, that's evolution in action. You see these peppered moths, they evolved into 
Birds. Birds. He hasn't figured it out. Moths, right? <laughs> moths into moths. They became and so, butterflies. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so at Frogs. best, what you have here with a pepper moth is just variation, right? At best. Turns out, though, with the actual study that's used in many of the textbooks, the guy who did this study kind of rigged the data a bit and rigged some of the moths and kind of pulled some strings to get the conclusions he wanted. So mm -hmm. it may not even be valid, but even, at, even if it was, you still have moths becoming moths. That's right. it. And so they're talking about that. And then, of course, the article it mentions someone else who's kind of, they think they've proven that the original study was valid, therefore evolution must be true. And this new guy says evolution is true, therefore God is just a lie made up by humans, and therefore life has no meaning or value. The end. There you go. <laughs> Move on. Okay. Yeah, I think the author at least kind of got it here in the second, par in the second to last paragraph. He says, yeah, even if the classic pepper moth story were 100% true, it would not be proof of Darwinian evolution, much less of the human invention of God. At most, the story shows a change in the, in the proportions of two varieties of the same species. So really, I think what we can walk away with here is these moth researchers, they were blinded by the light of their foolishness. Blinded by blinded the light. Blinded by the light. Yeah, that I got was you. a good I got one. You. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That was a good yeah, one, you, yeah. you were stretching a bit. Look, I got you. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, but again, variation within the created kinds. Uh, moths make moths, birds make birds. We have some really good resources on this. First, this DVD done by Dr. Terry Mortson. It's an oldie, but a goodie. Some would say that about Terry, but anyway, all right. Mm -hmm. Awesome, love Terry to death, all right, but wonderful resource. Was Darwin right origin of this species? And Terry does a phenomenal job explaining these differences between uh, what we actually observe versus the ideas of evolution. It's so well done, easy to understand, a great resource. Yeah. And it's a DVD, also available on answers.tv, so you can check it out. Out there if you would like. Absolutely. And also another book called Glass House deals with this issue in depth. Uh, this is a great resource for those who are dealing with these evolutionary arguments on a consistent level for anyone really. And so it deals with some of the classic icons of evolution and debunks them at a profound level, at a scientific level. Really well done. Glass House, two great resources on these particular issues of variation adaptation versus macro or molecules demand evolution. Absolutely. And moving on from that, we'll cover these last two fairly quickly. Indiana Medical School plans to add woke diversity requirements for tenure and promotions. And so what it is, Indiana University School of Medicine is updating its tenure and promotion process to possibly include a requirement that faculty show effort, to, effort toward advancing DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. They must show effort to being woke. Well, the thing is, my husband came home and he was talking to me. He was like, uh, baby, what, about, what do you think about woke people? said, well, woke people, everybody sleep, everybody wake up. <laughs> so anyone learn the English right Well, now? I'm from Brazil. <laughs> English is my second language. <laughs> right. So he came to me with the past of the verb wake. <laughs> woke. And yeah. I was like, woke people? Yeah. And I was like, what in the world are you talking about? Yeah. So what does this word woke mean? So this woke ideology is part of the new kind of Marxist ideology of critical race theory, critical social justice permeating our culture. To be woke means that you're awake to the social problems of our day, the systemic injustices taking place according to critical race theory. So according to Marxist critical race theory, critical social justice, our culture is made up of oppressors and the oppressed. That's it. You fall in one of those two categories. And basically in our culture, the oppressors are whites, especially white males who are heterosexual and Christian, but whites in general. The oppressed are any of the minority groups, especially blacks, and even in our case, um, you have like sexual minorities, those who practice homosexuality, transgender people, those are sexual minorities, they have been oppressed. And what happens according to CRT, critical race theory, critical social justice, is that to get rid of the systemic oppression, people need to wake up, get woke to the oppression. The oppressed need to rise up and revolt against the oppressors to win the rights they deserve. And we should help as the oppressors. We should wake up as the oppressors, according to CRT, and we should give up our power, our privileges, and our abilities to them so the oppressors can have power and privilege in our culture and they can be seen as equal and be given equity in our culture. And so that's what it means to get woke, to buy into the Marxist paradigm of critical race theory, yeah. critical social justice. And you see these words all the time of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And they sound so good, but what they they mean today in the woke ideology is you must include diverse people. That would be the oppressed people, the oppressed minorities, non-whites and the oppressed sexual minorities. And the outcomes must be equitable. 
Everybody must get the same outcome. No matter what your background, no matter how hard you work, no matter what you do, the outcome Doesn't must be married. the same. There's a word for this. It's called socialism, yep. more yes. or less a Marxist ideology. And then on top of that, with this ideology in place, when you limit who you will or will not hire according to their identity group, think about it. Someone could or could not be hired based solely on the color of their skin. There's a name for that. It's called racism. It's racism. called racism. Right? Mm -hmm. And really, critical race theory at its core is a racist ideology. That's so that's a bit problems. of a long explanation, but that's what that woke ideology means at its core. Yeah, so bottom line, anytime you see that acronym DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, this is just a disguise for Marxism, critical social justice. It's actually promoting racism. And it's not just happening at, at universities, it's happening corporation wide, companies wide. I just came from a that's company, right, right that, was just, that was talking about the annual ethics training that we have to do every year, talking about the DEI. Have you got your DEI certification yet? You know, are you being more inclusive? But you think about the double standard, right? Being more inclusive of who exactly, if you're not inclusive of our ideology, basically. It's, mm -hmm. it's only with this ideology. So you see that double standard over and these Indiana again. professors are being forced to endorse, practice, and yeah. help that ideology. Yeah, and they're talking about discrimination, right? Racial discrimination, but who are they discriminating against in this case? Mm -hmm. Yep. All right, we'll quickly get to the last article. We'll squeeze it in, and I'll let Rob take this one away. But <laughs> the wow signal, an amateur astronomer may have pinpointed alien signal's origin. It's always aliens, right? So always really, aliens. I mean, this is not really just that, that wowing of a signal. If you guys are familiar with it, this is a signal that was detected back in 1977. When I was born. Essentially, it was... Uh, Dating you yourself go. already. It was a very brief but uh, powerful burst of radio waves lasting one minute and 12 seconds, essentially. So they called it the wow signal because they received it from a certain part, in this part of the sky. It had some kind of alpha numeric code is what they thought. So they said, oh, well, obviously this had to come from the alien civilization. And their storytelling is that uh, since hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe, there is good logic in guessing that an intelligent civilization within our galaxy would be able to attract it by basically sending out that frequency line, because every element has a certain uh, frequency radiation, right? So they were listening for hydrogen, and they said, look, we found this uh, hydrogen radiation, so obviously it came from aliens. And I actually talked to um, our, our resident uh, astronomer about this, Danny Faulkner, and he kind of came to the same conclusion that I did. It's really not that impressive. Basically what they're saying is, is that they found a burst of radio waves and they, it's coming from this part of the, of the sky, and that's really as far as they can go. That's the fact, right? From there, they have to now go into the fiction, the storytelling of saying, okay, it's, it's from this part of the sky, but there's a lot of other objects in that area, so we're going to instead focus on the one that could possibly harbor life. So it's a sun-like type of star with maybe an exoplanet going around the star. So it had to come from there, right? So you see the evolutionary bias, the evolutionary worldview kind of creeping in, of course. So at the end of the day, it's just, it's just not that wowing. Not that wow. I don't know if that's a wow. word or not. Yeah. <laughs> I don't that's know if it's a wow. word either. You know. All right. <laughs> Didn't wow me. <laughs> yeah. And so, again, we see that the worldview kind of determines their conclusions. And again, as Gabby said earlier, it always gets down to that fundamental issue. Who's your authority? What's your foundation for your thinking? You've got two options. It's either God's word or man's. And guys, when we start with God's word, we'll see that real science and real observations in science and culture confirm the Bible again and again and again. And of course, we are skimming the surface on giving answers to all these sorts of things. If you want to dive deeper on these issues, go to our website, answersandgenesis.org. There are thousands of articles and videos giving you in-depth answers on all these things. But you can find them here also at answersnews or answers.org. We're so glad you've been here with us today. We'll see you guys next time. God bless. It's coming.